Dr. Brick Harris, thank you so much for speaking with me again and continuing this conversation about children, trauma, and, and all that, that you have dedicated your life to and all you're working on. Um, it's always an honor and a pleasure to speak to you. Likewise, it's good to see you again. It's good to talk to you again. Please call me Nadine. Yeah. Thank you, Nadine. So, uh, you know, when we last we last spoke about uh, we last spoke around the onset of this uh, this pandemic, and we spoke about children and our concerns for for children and families during this time. Um, I know it's a broad question to say how how are children doing, but but to ask what you're seeing or what your focus or concerns have, have been. Yeah, so uh, what we're seeing is that, um, yeah, it's a broad range. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Some families are enjoying the time, more time together, um, but for some of our most uh, vulnerable children, it's been a very, very difficult time. I think the thing that I'm most concerned about is that at the onset of the pandemic, when the shelter in place uh, went into place, we saw about a 50% reduction in our reports of child maltreatment. And although that sounds good, that's actually extremely concerning because what that means is that there wasn't overnight a 50% drop in child maltreatment. In fact, if we look at the other indicators like intimate partner violence, other signs of, um, you know, family uh, discord or, or, or family uh, violence, those have been increasing. So the fear is that the because children are not in school, because they're not at their after school programs and coming into contact with the safe and nurturing adults who would identify if there's something wrong, that actually what we're seeing is just a profound lack of identification of child maltreatment that's happening. And, and when that happens, when a child mm -hmm. is, we know, we know the worst, of course, when a child mm -hmm. is being harmed and, and it's not identified, we know, we know the worst outcome. Psychologically, when, when something, I suppose, focusing in your work, your work on trauma, and how when trauma is not identified, when the abuse is not identified, certainly the abuse worsens. When the trauma is not identified and the child is suffering internally, it's hard to see, right? mm -hmm. whether it be teachers. It's very hard to identify. Sometimes it's even seen and ignored mm -hmm. uh, by family, by society, um, by the courts. What happens to a child, if you can explain, when they carry that trauma and it's not addressed when it's not treated? Well, that has been the focus of my, my research and my clinical practice for many years. But what we understand is that uh, especially repeated exposure or severe exposure to adversity, when it's not identified, when it's not intervened upon, can actually lead to long-term changes to the um, children's brains and bodies, right? And it can impact their, uh, both their immediate and short-term health and well-being, which can show up in terms of uh, behavior, learning, attention, lots of different uh, ways of manifest. And it can even impact things like uh, how our immune system works, right? The ability to fight off infections, the, uh, the, the ways in which the uh, kind of all of the ways, all of the systems in our bodies work, right? Um, and these long-term changes to, uh, what we can also see is that the, the biological stress response can become overactive. And that overactivity, which means that the body experiences higher levels or, or prolonged levels of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, that can lead to long-term changes in children's brains and bodies. So when we talk about the impact of trauma or adversity that is not recognized and addressed, there are real significant and long-term impacts that can happen. And that's why you know, 
early identification and early and, and, and coordinated response is so critically important. And one of the things I know that the, it's, it's been discussed and I think people will find interesting is how often ADHD and OCD is, you know, is covering what is actually trauma and is, is not in fact um, ADHD. Could you, could you speak on that and maybe what the dangers are if, if it is assumed to be uh, ADHD and treated that way? Um, yeah. Kind of how that affects the child. So this is something that I saw really commonly in my clinical practice as a pediatrician, was that kids would be referred to me and say, oh, they've got ADHD, can you put them on some Ritalin or whatever the medication may be? And um, it's important to understand that part of the reason for that is because when, when a child's fight or flight response is activated, the, the part of the brain, the, the fear center, the amygdala gets activated and it actually sends signals to the part of the brain that's responsible for executive functioning. The part that helps us pay attention and have impulse control and, and exercise, you know, uh, strong judgment. And this part, it's a prefrontal cortex. It turns it way, way down right? It actually decreases the activity of the prefrontal cortex. And so for all the world, it can look like ADHD. But that's why it's so important for us to understand whether there is a history of trauma, whether there, there is a history of adversity, because the number one treatment for ADHD is a stimulant, right? Which is essentially very much like a stress hormone. It's like adrenaline, right? It's, it's an upper, and, um, and so, and that makes sense if it's pure ADHD and that's, you know, the only thing that's going on. But if that, uh, you know, inhibition of our executive functioning is due to really high levels of stress hormones, then adding a stimulant isn't necessarily the right way to go. The most important thing in that setting is reducing the dose of adversity and, and enhancing the buffering caregiving interventions. And that can be safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. It can be things like mindfulness or meditation. It can be things like, there are even certain medications that are more appropriate to use that help to reduce the activation of the stress response. And that's why it's so important for us to understand whether or not trauma or adversity is at play. So how do you do screenings or how would, if a child was to walk in, into your clinic or your, and you, you sat with a child and, and you notice signs, signs of what would be seen as ADHD or um, something is wrong with this child, how do you identify? How do you talk to the child? What do you look for? How would you want others to, to speak with that child and work with that child? to know what is truly happening. So, you know, the funny thing about it is, is that I think a lot of people think that if there's something going on, if there's trauma going on uh, in a household or with a family, that they can tell by looking. And the truth is, is that you can't tell by looking. And that's why we in California have launched this initiative called ACEs Aware to train all of our healthcare providers on how to screen for childhood adversity, uh, for adverse childhood experiences, and how to uh, recognize signs and symptoms that uh, an individual may be having a, what we call the toxic stress response, that's the prolonged activation of the stress response, and how to respond with trauma-informed care. So, you know, uh, it, it, it really, it, it requires training that, you know, that's all, that's all I can say. It requires like training. Trauma assessment, pardon, didn't mean to speak over you, but like yeah. a trauma assessment of some time to speak with the child to. Um, yes. Yeah. So we, uh, the, the, the training that we use and the tool that we use in California is a, uh, just a very quick assessment of exposure to adversity. It's based on the 
adverse childhood experiences study that was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And it's something that can be done in the course of a regular healthcare visit in, in five minutes or less. Now, we train our healthcare providers to screen, but as you said, right, everyone, all of us, educators, judges, childcare workers, police officers, everyone should be trained in understanding how early adversity can impact health, behavior, development. I mean, it's a little bit like, um, I say it's a little bit like learning that, oh, you know, microbes cause infection, right? <laughs> right. When we understand, oh my goodness, this is the origin, this is how it works, then there's an implication for everyone. You know, cough into your elbow, wash your hands, right. some of these basic things. And so there are so many of our systems nowadays that respond to, you know, behavior challenges, um, health challenges, whatever it is, without this fundamental understanding of how early adversity can be manifesting in these ways. And so that piece is really crucial. And I think, if I may, that that is a big part of that is taking seriously issues like domestic violence taking seriously the effects of domestic violence and, and, and um, helping people even to be educated on what is domestic violence and, or what is abuse within a home, what is, how, how things affect a child. Because it's not often as people think of it and they're expecting it to be this one idea of what they think it is and therefore they can say it is or isn't. But in fact, the complexities of how, um, of different ways children especially are harmed um, within a uh, within a home, um, for example, are are many times issues that people don't want to address. And I think I know that's not maybe the medical discussion, but there is this. It's hard to look at some of these these issues. And I will say one of the challenges must be in in asking questions to children, doing the ACEs uh, screenings. A lot of these children are used to not speaking about the abuse. Mm -hmm. they're, they're used oh, yeah. To, and they don't even know what is abuse. If somebody was to say, have you ever been this or that? Or have you ever been? Maybe they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk. They wouldn't know it's safe to talk or they wouldn't know how to describe because they don't know what is safe and unsafe or what is right and wrong because they haven't known. Yeah. yeah. So that is. That is unfortunately common, what you are describing. And I think that it can, I, I, I will say, it, um, it, it can feel like so much. It can feel really um, uh, challenging to address. But I think that when we have these conversations, I think you, you may have noticed in the couple of times that we've chatted, the thing that literally gets me out of bed in the morning is the recognition that we have the power to change that, right? We have the power to raise the awareness, even through this, com this conversation, right? And let folks know, help, help young people coming up today understand, right? That it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you, right? Changing the, the framing of that, that question and helping young people to understand, oh, wait a minute, you know what, because of what I experienced, then the fact that I may be feeling this way, or I may have more challenges with, you know, my behavior, my impulse control, or I may get sick easily when I feel overwhelmed. That's actually normal. That's actually my body trying to protect me. And in fact, what's abnormal is the things that I've experienced right? That's, and that shouldn't be happening. And I think that we're in this moment right now uh, where we have a, just a powerful ability to, or opportunity, I will say, opportunity. Uh, it's a window. And I hope that we take advantage of it to really change this narrative and raise awareness so that we are doing things differently across the board. So I know you've been working so hard these last months and there's been some progress, but I don't know how much you've been able uh, to do and I know how important it is. So can you tell me 
what you have been able to accomplish and what you're working on. Yeah. Um, so I can say, so what we've done here in California, honestly, is um, a nation leading, and I will actually say world leading effort. I was just last week at uh, participating in the World Innovation Summit on Health. And I was leading uh, a, a group on, on childhood adversity. That was, you know, uh, and it, it was folks from, from all over the world having this conversation. And I was sharing what we are doing here in California. And we are pretty much the, the furthest along. The fact that we are systematically and that we have made an investment of over $150 million in California to train our healthcare providers on how to screen for adverse childhood experiences, how to recognize the signs and symptoms of that prolonged activation of the stress response, the toxic stress response, and then also how to respond with trauma-informed care. That is uh, pretty powerful. We're, we're, we're definitely leading the way. In fact, I had um, uh, I, the, the health minister of, of a, a nation in the Middle East reach, literally just reached out to me today and say, hey, we want to learn more about what you're doing and learn about your program. So the fact that California has trained almost 15,000 healthcare providers in, in identifying, doing that early identification so that we can do that uh, mm -hmm. early intervention is something I'm really proud of. It's, it is, it's wonderful. And it is very needed because as what you're doing in California now is, as you say, it's, it's, it is something that uh, should be shared around the world. But it's also a state that prior to you doing this, right, this state in itself was, you know, has, has um, how do I say this nicely? This, this state has a lot of problems. This state in particular had a lot of children returned to abusers, a lot of children who lost their lives, a lot of um, maltreatment, a lot of, right, this state in particular really, if any state needed you, it was this state, in my opinion, or one of them. I uh, yeah, I mean, I will say, I think that we are definitely, we have an incredible amount of work to do. And my hope is that the, the work that we've been doing in training our healthcare providers is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that is, well, we know that what is necessary is, uh, you know, training in every sector this, I mean, this needs to be just common knowledge. It really right? does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, and that's the, the danger of it. There's, there's so much of this and I know, and it's funny, it's hard. Cause I think there's things like this that seem so obvious, don't they? It's like when I find myself fighting for girls education internationally, I feel like it's silly to have a conference about it because how, who doesn't know that that's important. And it seems obvious that we should all be focusing on protecting children and making sure that those early developmental years are as protected and safe and understood as they can possibly be. And yet it's extraordinary how many people, um, whether it's the focus on the parental right over the child's health or it's the, or it's the not wanting to look at ugly sides of our society and our communities or certain families, that we just have not just come face to face with the damage that, uh, that is done to so many children. Um, and um, and so, yes, you're right. And this is the tip of an iceberg, but it doesn't start unless it starts with exactly what you're saying, this understanding of how how serious, that it's a medical crisis. I see it as a, it's a children's health crisis. Um, because if it's not understood, the lack of care or the wrong care causes so much damage to the child, right? So this is what I'm going to say. What you're talking about as a, a health crisis and a medical crisis is absolutely right. And not just for children, but when we look and we see that nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States are strongly associated with childhood adversity, heart disease, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's, right? 
there, there's so, so many of these health conditions and that we can uh, significantly, substantially, and we now see data from the CDC, from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, right? That m the early roots of many of these long-term health conditions reside in our childhood, our childhood health and well-being. And that activation of the stress response, the prolonged activation of the stress response, that toxic stress response can significantly increase the risk. So what we see is that this is not only a health crisis, but it's also an economic crisis. These are some of the biggest drivers of our healthcare costs. And for many people recognizing that, understanding how broad the impacts are is really new, right? And so that is the piece that, that's the work, right? If, we, if this was easy, it would be done already, right? <laughs> But this is the work is helping folks understand how absolutely critically important it is for us to do this early recognition and ensuring that children have safe, stable and nurturing relationships and environments. Yes. I wonder if there's also, who knows if this is, this will be cut out. <laughs> I, but I wonder if there's also, you know, for, for all of those who choose to ignore when they see the, the neglect of whether it be uh, a parent, the system, someone who, who uh, you know, is a medical practitioner but makes a decision to overlook certain things or not do training, not, not take seriously these issues. I would hope that at some point, uh, because it results in damage to children, it's not seen simply as something, you, oh, there's my dogs. But um, I would hope that, that because we know that the neglect of doing this work and, and, and addressing the needs actually harms children, that the choice to not pay attention to what you're saying, the choice to not uh, make the change within your practice or your courtroom is one day identified as causing harm to a child. And maybe somehow within that, there can be more responsibility to th that it's not a preference, it's a, it's a medical necessity. So this is, um, it, Angie, I, I feel like you, last time you said I could call you Angie, so I'm gonna call you that, okay. So um, th this has been a, a really critical part of, of my work is understanding how is it that someone could see this information, hear this information and not act on it, right? Um, and, and better understanding uh, all of the, the pieces that go behind that. And what I've observed and experienced, you know, when we are talking about here in California, 62% of Californians have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. Right, and about 17% of Californians have experienced four or more. So the idea that these things happen, it's not that people don't know that they're happening, we, we know, right? But I think that uh, part of it is, is folks believe that there's nothing that we can do about it, or if we do something about it, that it doesn't make a difference. Or, and frankly, there are so many people who are, um, I, 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 what I've had, fortunately, the very good fortune of experience, experiencing is that there are so many people who feel like they want to be part of the solution that, um, but they don't know what to do. And so this is why having initiatives like California's ACEs Aware initiative is so important because it helps to arm people by saying, okay, here are some really concrete steps that you can take so that you can feel like you, you, you have some support in understanding what to do. And the more people that feel like, okay, I can do this, right? You have the baby steps. And so you, you move to, you know, instead of a few people responding, you start to get to a few more people responding, the, the early majority and then the late majority. And then 
And then um, what you see is that we have the capacity to build the, the infrastructure yes. that, that folks can, can, you know, stabilize themselves on as they move forward in this work. And I think that is where my focus has been very much is trying to help and support uh, you know, primarily we've been focused on healthcare providers, but the same level of infrastructure and support is needed for educators. It's needed in law enforcement. It's needed in the justice system. It's need, and and that actually is um, something that our uh, I so I just finished just just finished the California Surgeon General's report on adverse childhood experiences on toxic stress, and the whole focus of that report is starting with the science so folks know that this is a public health crisis and then going from there and saying okay so how do we respond in healthcare how do we respond in in justice how do we respond in education and giving concrete examples of folks who have implemented this work to improve the health well-being and and the lives of children so that's that's so it, it, right. that's that is great yeah, we'll be out there any day now. Well, I think that's exactly what's needed. It is. It's a, it's such a big issue, and as you say, you have to build the infrastructure, build the build the way of understanding and accepting what you know the effects of of adverse childhood experiences. And I agree with you. I think it will help a lot of adults to understand themselves. So not just children. I think we all. We all learn something. We learn to be better parents, of course, and be better and be more aware. But we learn something about ourselves. And I think if we can all, um, we're all walking around looking, how do, how do we stabilize? How can we be better people? How do we, what's going on with us? Why is this, why are these relationships this way? Or why do I not be, why can't I not settle this? And we, and there's a lot out there that tells people they should, you know, oh, you've label yourself with this or get the right, instead of give yourself a break. Maybe you've been through something and, and uh, and that there are people who care, and there's healing, and there's understanding, and um, but first and foremost to to meet it head on. So that is really wonderful. Um, I want to ask you about racial justice and how that's so central uh, central to addressing trauma, and how it you know we know we know how um, you know these issues disproportionately affect uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and uh, can you can you talk more about the con connection or how you're connecting it or addressing it? Sure. So. Yeah. I mean, racial injustice is inherently traumatic, right? And uh, trauma informed systems, trauma informed practices are fundamental to healing uh, our long standing legacy of. Uh, racial trauma in the United States. I think one of the things that is um, incredibly uh, powerful is, you know, I'm I'm a scientist. I'm a physician. I'm a researcher. I'm also a black woman. I'm also the mom of four black boys, and um, and so I think that as we as we um, think about this this work and think about how crucial, how fundamental it is. As someone who is a, as a researcher in toxic stress, to see that when, when my kids witness or experience racial injustice or they even the things that they see on TV, um, uh, I know part of the thing that tears me up about it is that I know what's happening in their bodies. I know that every time, like when, when our older boys who are 17, you know, when they watch the George Floyd video, right? I know that it activates their fight or flight response because they see themselves. And I feel like uh, when we look at the ways in which um, experiences of trauma get under our skin and change our biology and the ways in which that can also 
be handed down from generation to generation. And when I say handed down from generation to generation, I also mean biologically the risk, like it can literally get under our skin and affect our DNA, right? And when we look at the, the legacy of intergenerational, uh, the, 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 the trauma from generations, right? That our Native American communities, our indigenous communities, our African American communities, our, you know, the whole variety of our communities have experienced and to recognize that that can put our next generations at increased risk, right? We, we actually, part of the reason that we know this, that we understand this is that when we study the, the children and the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, what we see is that there are, uh, you know, changes associated with the way that DNA is read and transcribed from having endured severe trauma. Mm. Yes, that can be handed down to the next generation and the following generation. And that, that, that's why these healing interventions are so crucial because we are talking about the way that trauma gets under our skin and changes our biology. And so when we think about what it means for us to put into place trauma-informed systems and practices, right? Mm -hmm. It's really about putting into place these healing systems and practices. We, we, we have to recognize that, that racial justice is, uh, is, a, is a powerful issue of social justice but it's also a powerful issue of health and well-being, right? Um, and so, so that's you can you can tell it's something that I feel really passionate. That is, about. And I really don't hear enough people speak on that and think of so what what that will mean. To, we we speak about when you you know justice and people think of you know. Uh, move, moving things forward or setting a right wrong or uh, understanding or accountability or or um but but we don't often think of okay but how to what is what what would could possibly heal that trauma what could possibly um that generational trauma that 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 deep body trauma and it must be a lot of a lot of a correction with a lot of understanding and support, love, care. I don't That's, know. Right. That's right. The fact that African-Americans still have a shorter life expectancy than whites in the United States, and that since the time that we have ever been recording life expectancy, African-Americans have had a shorter life expectancy uh, than whites in the United States, is undoubtedly in part due to the legacy of racism and racial trauma in the United States. And that is something that if we ever hope to get to, to equity or parity or any of those things, we have to be looking at how do we heal those wounds. Absolutely. <sighs> Imagine the amazing conversations you must be having with your four boys. You know, may I say amazing because they have you as a mother, heavy, heavy conversations, big conversations these days, but also what, what, a, what an extraordinary thing to, to, be, to have four boys in this world and can, with everything that uh, is happening and with all your knowledge, it must be, a, it must be quite, quite amazing conversations you have. Uh, I will tell you um, the the interesting thing about doing this research, being in this role, uh, having this work, is that um, especially I think now during the pandemic, when all of us have so much on our plates, the thing that just um, lands with me over and over again is just the impact of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. 
And I feel like that is what my husband and I work really hard to uh, create for our boys. And in a weird way, right? This is kind of the weirdest thing in the, in the world. Um, that starts with me taking care of myself, right? That starts so with... That's so hard. That's always the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, like my people who know me know my number one slogan is that self-care isn't selfish, right? And that's the thing as we, as moms, we, we, we have to care for ourselves because you can hear all this in the context of the conversation that we've been having. It could be really, really heavy, right? Like it, it's, I will tell you, there have been many times, especially over this summer between, you know, everything that's been happening in terms of racial justice and, and COVID that, you know, there, I have shed more than one tear and, um, and just recognizing that one of the most important thing that I can do for my boys is to care for and nurture myself so that when we do have to have some of these hard conversations, when we do, when we are moving through the world, when we're seeing things on TV, whatever it is, that I can come from a place of wholeness and lightness and, and, um, such an important message. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is, you're exactly, it's taken me, I've been up and down during, like many people and feeling, uh, had those, I, I've, I still wrestle with understanding self-care as I don't, I know intellectually it's important, but I still have, I, I, I have a, a little bit of a block, but exactly what you're saying, trying to get the stress away from me or get the distraction or whatever, the darkness, whatever it is away to be the light for them, to be, to be hopeful, to be love, joyous, to be loving, um, that that seems to have become so much what I'm doing in the pandemic, more than all these other things I thought I would be doing. That's what I'm doing. And, um, it it, uh, it is it's quite it's quite it was quite a revelation to realize that's what they needed most. Yeah, and it, it, one of the things that's powerful about that is that that self care is not just uh, the importance of self care is not just true for us as parents and as caregivers, but for someone who's an educator for them to keep that light and that energy for the kids who they're interacting with. They're, they're trying to keep up that energy over Zoom or whatever. Watching them. <laughs> I, I will tell you, you know, in doing this work with healthcare providers, as we've been, you know, doing the trainings and, and helping to build capacity within our healthcare system, the number one thing I hear about is self-care. How do we do self-care for those who are healers, for those who are on the front lines, for those who are... Um, you know, trying to implement this work. And it turns out in order for us to, to walk that talk, right? One of the most, it, it, it's essential in, in, in every sector if you're, whether you're an educator or you're a judge or you're to, to do that self-care because it also tells us, I think it shows us that, oh, there, there is a way through that they're actually, even if you're exposed to some really hard, difficult, dark, challenging things that when we surround ourselves with folk, with people who really care for us and nurture us, and when we deeply care for and nurture ourselves, that there is a path forward, right? And that we can support our own health and well-being, and it does make a huge difference in our health, our well-being, our our behavior, our relationships, and all of the above. Well, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think it makes so much sense now talking everything that we've just been speaking about. And I really hope people do, do hear this, that it's for what we're speaking about now, learning this to take care so we can be the best mothers we can be. We can do everything that comes from also that understanding back to your 
you know, childhood adversity back to understanding yourself, accepting what you've gone through, finding your center, knowing, knowing what's, uh, what you need, what you're, what you deserve, what's all, what's the care. Um, and it certainly feels it's, it's wonderful to talk to you and to know that you're so, um, deeply, uh, in this fight to make this better. Um, and, uh, and to build this infrastructure to get us all thinking about this differently and to put new training forward, new understanding forward, new screenings forward to be able to improve the lives of, of all the young people. So then we grow into more stable adults. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right.